good morning and welcome to worship here at Glen Hope. My name is Kevin and I'm one of the pastors here. Um, as we get ready to head into worship, we've got a couple announcements for this week. The first thing is that uh, Christmas Fest will be this Saturday out in the field and so we're going to have a big big old Christmas tree that we're going to light it up and keep lit up for our community through this season. We're going to have hay rides, games, music, hot chocolate, and a whole lot more. And so you'll want to come to that. You'll want to invite your friends to that. You'll find flyers up here. Um, if you've got a yard where people drive by, we've got yard signs where you can grab one of those and stick it in your yard as a way for people to see and find out about Christmas Fest that will be this week. Um, senior Adult Bible Study will resume this Tuesday at 11, and Awanas and Student Bible Study will resume Wednesday at their normal times. Uh, we're coming into the Christmas season, and so one of the things that we take part in during the Christmas season at Southern Baptist is the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And so if you don't know what that is, it's an offering that's given at Christmas time, and every cent that is given to, to this goes directly to international missionaries. So missionaries who are on um, in other countries telling folks about Jesus. And so through the month of December, we'll be taking up money for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Our goal this year is $7,500. Um, and if you um, need envelopes to put your offering in, they can be found on the rails as well as prayer guides to help you pray through and pray for missionaries during this season. And then finally, kind of as a save the date, on December 22nd at 6 p.m., we'll be having our candlelight Christmas service um, and here in the sanctuary. And so this morning as we enter into worship, the Hodges are going to start us off by lighting the Hope Advent candle. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Don't fall that side. All right. So we're, um, we're going to start off by reading from Isaiah. We'll go uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. So truly, they were a people walking in darkness, hoping for that great light. Then at just the right moment, their hope and all of ours uh, was fulfilled. Now, Isaiah told of a coming Messiah who would establish a kingdom ruled by the justice and righteousness of God. The Jewish people had been waiting for this coming Messiah from the time that the prophecy was given. So in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So later in uh, John, Jesus spoke of that light. John eight twelve says, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Today we light the candle of hope as we look to the light of the world and the hope of eternal life that he provides. Let us pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, um, we thank you so, so much um, for the Son that you sent as a sacrifice for us um, to be that ray of hope that, that we all need, Lord. We are so unworthy of all that you have graced us with and given us, Lord. Thank you so much for this season, this time of remembering um, and praising you. Um, we are so gracious for, for all that you do for us. Please continue to be with us as we go forward um, through these weeks of Advent and uh, as we move on towards the celebration of, of your life, Jesus. Uh, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. 
as we continue to worship this morning, um, I just want to encourage everyone this, this season to make time to come before the feet of Jesus and just spend time in his presence and adore him. So let's stand and worship together. Just see. 
Amen. Um, I've been encouraged this week uh, as I've been doing, me and my wife have been doing a Bible study, um, talking about uh, the lineage of Jesus and how God's plan continues to mold uh, through people who were sinners and who were broken. And it's just been really encouraging to remind me that even though um, we're full of sin and that we're broken people, that God can still use us to do great things for his glory. And um, so I just wanted to encourage you guys um, to remember that this time of year um, as we continue to worship this morning.
be seated.
Let's enter into, into a time of prayer for, especially for those around us in this holiday season. Father, we come today for your throne of grace to be open to us and to those around us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we would be truly thankful that the Christmas season brings to us the good news that a Savior has come to the earth. And Father, how we do pray that as we walk among our friends and family members and those that you put into our lives in this time, that you would reveal afresh that you are a God of loving kindness and compassion, just as your word has told us. And Father, that, that you who have invited all to come to you, Lord, saying, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Lord, you are a God of invitation, and Lord, you are a good shepherd, and you invite the weary to receive your costly grace and your forgiveness. Help us, Lord, who have come to you to abide in your love. And Lord, though we might be helpless to speak to the deep needs of the human heart, your spirit sees, your spirit knows, your spirit invites, and your spirit give words, gives words of grace and truth and love and mercy. And Lord, it's through the cross that forgiveness comes to us. So we pray that you would grant to us to compassionately care and bring your loving kindness to those around us in the gospel. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. all for participating in worship today we've had a good morning of worship thus far if you have your Bibles and I hope you do I'd invite you to meet me in John chapter 3 John chapter 3 while you're turning there some of y'all already know this because because you know we go through books of the Bible, so this is just the trajectory. We're only going to be looking at John 3.16 today. It's one of the most familiar verses there is to uh, people in general. If you watched the Michigan game yesterday where they upset Ohio State, you would have noticed on Michigan's last field goal, there was a giant John 3.16 sign in the student section behind the goalpost. And so John 3.16 is a part of American culture, but that doesn't mean all the people in our culture know what that verse means and understand what that verse means. So hopefully by the end of the day, we'll know exactly what that means and can wrap our minds around that. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll start digging into the Word. Father, we thank you for the day, and we thank you for the chance to study your Word. I ask that you would be with us this morning, that you would help us to hear from you, to hear what your Spirit is saying to the church through your Word. And I ask that you'd hide me far behind your cross so that people see and hear you and not me. Let the understand the words um, that I'm looking to share, the words that you've given me to give to them and not just my own ideas. I ask that you would arrest us, capture our attention with your word, with your mercy, and with your love for us and help us to respond to that rightly. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you guys can remember 90s TV? Nowadays, you can just watch all your TV at one time. They drop a whole season worth of shows. You just stream them, and then 8 to 16 hours, you're done. But back when I was growing up and TV was going on, you'd have episodes that would be split. You'd have commercial breaks, and if, if you don't get back from grabbing your snacks in time, you're going to miss half the show. And you can pop in on a to-be-continued episode, two-part episodes. And in a to be continued episode, you'd, you'd have the first part and then it'd say to be continued and then the next week you'd pop in and it'd kind of be like this vignette that's like what happened last week and then it'd dive right into what was going on this week. And that's very much what this week's sermon's going to be because we started our look at Nicodemus's 
in Jesus' dialogue last week. And so we're going to start with a quick recap, a quick vignette of what happened last week between Nicodemus and Jesus, and then we'll get into what's happening today. So as a reminder, there is a, this man who comes to Jesus. His name is Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, and he was a master teacher of Israel. So this, meant, this meant that he was a person who sought to live set apart. I'm going to obey the law. I'm going to understand what God's law is. Then I'm going to add a couple extra laws to make sure I don't get close to disobeying the law. He was a Sanhedrin member, which meant he was a ruler of the Jews. Think government lines. And then he was a master teacher. So he should have been an expert in the Old Testament. So Jesus is out here performing signs and wonders. And so Nicodemus comes to him under the shadow of night. He wants to engage with Jesus. And Jesus sees what's inside of Nicodemus because Jesus sees what's inside of all people, including everyone in this room. And what we find out is that Nicodemus needs to be born again. Jesus just keeps repeating and explaining to Nicodemus the need to be born again. Now, when we talk about what it means to be born again, we're going to do like the quickest summary of what that looks like. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says this. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so we see this picture of what new birth looks like. You first hear the gospel, and then you believe the gospel, and then you're sealed by the Spirit. Or to connect this to what we looked at last week, you hear the gospel, you believe the gospel, and then you're born again. And so that is how one is born again. It's in the hearing and believing of the gospel. And so Jesus told Nicodemus that he must be born again. And that's where we drop into our text today. John chapter 3, starting in verse 9, it says this. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up, that, so that whoever believes in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so Jesus jumps, so we jump right back into this dialogue between Nicodemus and Jesus. In verse 9, Nicodemus says to Jesus, how can these things be? Nicodemus just doesn't get it, or he doesn't believe it, one of the two. And he's like, what do you mean, be born again? What do you mean, I need to be born again? How do these things happen? How can these things be? And Jesus responds to him in verse 10 by saying, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? And so Jesus brings out the fact that he is this master teacher, this expert in the Old Testament. He's like, how do you not understand these things? This is a rebuke from Jesus, where Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you should know this. You should get this. You've dealt with the scriptures. You know what's in the scriptures. And so as Jesus rebukes Nicodemus for not understanding this, this lets us know that this idea of being born again is a scriptural idea, not just in the New Testament where we engage with it all the time, but it's something that you see in the Old Testament as well, which is, which is the scriptures that Nicodemus would have. Last week we looked at this from Ezekiel chapter 36. Again, we'll run through it this week. Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 24. God is speaking here, and he says, For I will take from you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. And then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statues, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And so when we have God speaking here, what we see is him saying that I am going to make you clean. He's not talking about taking a bath. He's not talking about taking dirt off of somebody. He's talking about moral cleanness. He's going to make us clean spiritually. 
emotionally. We can tell that because he talks about removing from you all your filthiness and from all your idols, which is sin. And so he's saying, I'm going to make you clean. Two times he says, I'll make you clean. And then two times he says, I'll give you something new. He says, I'll give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. This is the new birth. That is what God is describing in Ezekiel. And so Jesus is rebuking Nicodemus for not understanding this. He says, you're a master teacher. You should get this. You should understand this. Why don't you get this, Nicodemus? But what's interesting here, or at least what I find to be interesting, is that Jesus rebukes Nicodemus for not understanding what the Old Testament teaches but then he doesn't point Nicodemus towards the Old Testament to explain it. And Jesus doesn't go, all right, let, let's open up our scrolls and turn to Ezekiel 36. No, Jesus points to himself. Jesus tells Nicodemus to look to him, or at least that's where he begins. Now, if it was me, we would be opening up scrolls and turning to Ezekiel 36 and, and walking through. This is what the new birth looks like in the Old Testament, but that's not what we see Jesus doing. So Jesus continues to tell Nicodemus about the new birth. He's given him direct revelation of the gospel, direct revelation of good news. And it begins here. First, Nicodemus has to believe Jesus' testimony. Nicodemus has to believe Jesus' testimony. Verse 11, it said, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And so we start off in verse 11, and we see that construction of truly, truly again. We learned last week that any time Jesus starts off with saying, well, truly, truly, or verily, verily, it's pointing to the idea that this is something important. This is something we need to see. This is of great, of great importance. So Jesus says to you, I speak to you, or we speak of what we know and testify of what we've seen, and you do not accept our testimony. Now, if you have a question of who the we is there, Jesus used this construction, this way of saying this, to connect what he is saying back to verse 2, where Nicodemus came to Jesus on his own accord. He comes by himself, but he begins his discussion by saying, Rabbi, we know. Speaking, it, speaking in the plural as if he is a representative of Israel. And so what Jesus is saying here, by connecting those we's together, Jesus is in essence saying, you came as a representative to Israel, and what I'm saying applies to Israel. I'm speaking to all of y'all. You do not accept my testimony. So Jesus points out that his, acceptimony, his testimony is not being accepted. He then goes on to say, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now the earthly things that Jesus is speaking of here is the new birth or being born again. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, I've told you you have to be born again. I've explained to you about being born again and you don't believe. Like I said earlier, when Nicodemus comes... When Nicodemus responds to Jesus in verse 9, he says, how can these things be? And it seems as if he doesn't understand, but Jesus' rep response implies it's not that he doesn't understand, it's that he doesn't believe. Because he's addressing belief here. If I told you these things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And so the heavenly things that are being talked about here, or spoken about here, are the splendors of the consummated kingdom. When God's kingdom fully comes to earth, and that is the only kingdom that there is, those are the heavenly things. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, how are you going to believe me if I tell you about that if you won't even believe me when I tell you about this? If you won't believe me when I tell you about the new birth, how will you believe anything I have to say about the kingdom of God? And friends, that is the reality for all of us. Because if you don't experience the new birth, there is no kingdom of God for you. There is no heaven for you. There is no eternity with God outside of being born again. And so Jesus says to Nicodemus, you're not believing the things I tell you about this. Why would I think you'd believe about these other things? He goes on in verse 13 to say, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. 
Jesus is letting Nicodemus know why he is the authority here, why what he is saying needs to be accepted versus what others have said or what Nicodemus' current understanding is. Jesus is saying, I am the authority here. You need to accept my authority. And he tells him that it's because he has direct knowledge from heaven. He has direct knowledge from the kingdom. He has direct knowledge from the throne of God because that's where he, is com- where he has come from. Jesus is not like my dad. When we were growing up, dad would tell us to do stuff and, and we could choose to do it or not to do it. And that was a whole other issue. But he would tell us to do stuff. And if we said, why? Or what's the reason or anything like that he'd say because I said so Jesus doesn't hear say because I said so Jesus says I have the authority to speak about heavenly matters because I've come from heaven I have descended no one has ascended meaning no one has gone up except he who has descended from heaven this is what the incarnation is about as pastor Lewis took us through the introduction of John in John chapter 1 verse 1 we're told that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and you drop down to verse 14 and says and the word became flesh so Jesus who was in the beginning because he was with God because he is God became flesh he came from heaven to earth and so Jesus saying I had the authority to speak about this now a historical note here Judaism in the day would argue that, or it would circulate stories that certain saints had ascended to heaven to get information from God. And Jesus is saying the exact opposite of what their tradition says here. Because Jesus says that no one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended. Meaning no one's gone up except the one who's come down, and that dude is me. I am the authority. I am the one who can speak to you of heavenly things. Jesus is saying that he is the only authoritative voice. And that's something that we need to hear today, friends, because we live in a world that teaches this idea of plural, pluralism, that all roads lead to Christ, that, that all roads can get you to God. And you can mix and match them, and you can get to God. You can take a little bit of Islam and throw in some Hinduism and throw in some Buddhism, and you can get there. Or you can declare that this is their truth and I have my own truth and so I can get there. But Jesus is saying, no, the only one who can speak authoritatively about this is me. It's as if we take this idea that there's this great mountain and God's at the top of the mountain and it doesn't matter which road you take to the top because all roads lead to the top. And what Jesus is saying that no roads lead to the top and that's why I had to come down. He's the only authoritative voice when it comes to matters of eternity and salvation. And so Jesus calls Nicodemus to trust his testimony. But then he also calls Nicodemus to believe his proclamation. Jesus proclaims something to Nicodemus that Nicodemus has to believe. Verses 14 and 15. It says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And so this proclamation is pointing us further into the kingdom, deeper into God's kingdom. It's telling us about eternal life. That phrase eternal life literally means the age to come. So it's pointing to eternity and what eternity looks like for us. And Jesus makes this proclamation, and it's something about a snake and something about a need to believe. Which if Nicodemus wasn't confused before, maybe he's he's a little bit more confused now because why are you talking about a snake and the need to believe? The key here for us to understand this is that last little bit of verse 14 where it says, be lifted up. That phrase, be lifted up, that's that's what connects it all. That's the hinge that it turns on. That's the key that unlocks the door to knowledge for us here about what Jesus is saying. That phrase, be lifted up, is used two more times in the book of John. We're going to look at one of those. In John chapter 12, verses 32 and 33, Jesus uses this phrase. And he says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he would die. And so Jesus uses this phrase of being lifted up. He says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men to myself. And he was talking about how he would die. 
And so now we know there's a connection between something about a snake and Jesus dying, or the type of way Jesus would die. And with that background, we can go to Numbers chapter 21 and figure out exactly what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Like I told you, Jesus started by pointing to himself when he was dialoguing with Nicodemus, and now he's taking Nicodemus into the scriptures to explain being born again, to explain the way of salvation to him. So Numbers chapter 21, we'll start in verse 5. It says, The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. And so we have this picture of what's going on with Israel. In verse 5, the people are complaining against God. They're complaining against God and Moses. And in Israel's history, this is post the Exodus. They've come out of Egypt. They are in the wilderness. And so the people are complaining and saying, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and there is no water. In other places, they complain about specifically what they used to have. We used to have onions. They'd give us some meat. Yeah, it was bad because we were slaves and they were beating us, but at least we had onions. And they're complaining here. But notice that in their complaint, they say, you brought us to this place with no food, and at the end they say, we loathe this miserable food. So it wasn't that there wasn't provision. It was that they didn't like it. And so they're complaining against God. And because of this, God brings judgment in the way of fiery serpents. Fiery serpents come, these snakes, and they're biting the people. And as they bite the people, the people die. And so the people then seek mercy. They recognize in verse 7 that they've sinned because they spoke against the Lord. And they say, Moses, intercede for us. Speak to God for us. Try and fix this for us, which Moses does. And then God gives them a merciful provision. He tells Moses to make this serpent of bronze, put it on a standard, which means put it on a pole and lift it up and tells the people, if you are bitten and you look at the snake, you won't die. You will be healed. So the people had to believe God for this to work. It wasn't enough to think to yourself and believe in your head, oh yeah, looking at that snake will save me if I get bit by one. But you had to believe enough to actively look at the snake. You had to actually look at it to be healed. You had to look to the serpent to be saved for those folks. And Jesus' point to us is this. Look to the cross and be saved. You must look to the cross and be saved. You must believe that this is God's answer for your problem and look to it. So what does all that mean? There's a parallel between what's going on with Israel in the wilderness and us. Here's the parallel. First, we see the, in verse 5, we saw the people's complaint. That was their sin. They sinned against God. And in the same way, all of us sin against God. If we just run through the Ten Commandments, we can get everybody in this room condemned for sinning against God. Does anybody have an idol? What's an idol? Anything you put in your life before God. Anything. And so if God is not the number one thing in your life, everybody has an idol. You can check that one off as a rule you've broken. Have you ever told a lie? Well, that would make you a liar, which is another one of God's Ten Commandments. Have you ever stolen something? Even just like a toy from your sibling? That would make you a thief. You may have never committed adultery, but Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount takes it a step further and says if you've ever lusted after another person in your heart, you've committed adultery. And Jesus saying that should strike the fear, should strike fear in the heart of anybody who's ever looked at pornography. Because you just ticked off another one. 
We're told, do not murder. Jesus again elevates and says, if you have hate in your heart for another person, you've committed murder. As we think about our siblings and the fact that most all siblings don't get along at some point and have some knockdown drag out brawls and they fight and then they scream, I hate you. What the scripture says to you is murderer. We've all sinned. We've all broken God's commands. We've all broken God's laws. And so we've got the same problem the Israelites had. Judgment is coming. Judgment for Israel was these fiery serpents. These serpents, they came and they bit folk and they were dying. Air judgment right now is separation from God. Anybody who sins is separated from God because of their sin. If something's not done to fix that problem, that is going to turn into an eternal separation. Where this eternal separation becomes bad is it's not just that you're not with God and it's like you're off somewhere living your life. It's an eternal separation by which you are judged for your rebellion against a good and loving God. You're sent to a place called hell. A literal place of torment. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, which means you can't die. And the torment just lasts for eternity. Everybody in this room is going to live eternally somewhere. It's just a matter of where that's going to be. And judgment is coming. So the people seek mercy. They say, Moses, intercede for us. Speak to God for us. Ask him to help us. In the same way, we ought to seek mercy. When we truly understand just how sinful we are, just how rebellious we are, just how wicked we are, we will seek mercy. There's a missionary named Paul Washer. It, it's who small Paul is named after. And Paul Washer says this, you have one great problem, and it is this. God is good. Now, on its face, that doesn't seem like a problem that God is good. But he goes on to say that this is a problem for you because God is good and you are not which means you don't qualify to be in his presence. You don't have the standard of holiness to be in his presence. You are a rebel against him. The scriptures would say that you are God's enemy. That's a big problem. And when we understand the reality of this problem, that we, apart from Jesus Christ, live as enemies of God, against a holy God, an all-powerful God that has demonstrated through history past that he brings judgment against rebels and sinners, friends, we will seek mercy. We will want mercy from God. And so God gave a provision of mercy to Israel. He gave them this bronze serpent and said, if you look to this serpent, you will be saved. You won't die from your snake bites. The provision of mercy that God gives to us is Jesus. Jesus comes and he lives the perfect life that none of us can live. On the cross, Jesus dies the death that all of us deserve. He has the wrath of God poured out on him for us. The punishment for air sins is poured out on Jesus on the cross. Jesus dies and he's buried, but three days later he rises from the dead. Jesus in dying on the cross made a way for you to be forgiven. He paid the penalty for your sin. Jesus in rising from the dead defeated death on your behalf. So Jesus has the ability to grant you forgiveness and eternal life. And what he says to us by way of Nicodemus is this. Look to the cross and be saved. In the same way Israel looked to the serpent, you must look to the cross. You must have to believe that this is God's provision. You must have to trust that this is God's means of salvation for you. Look to the cross. So Jesus tells Nicodemus, you need to believe my testimony. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, you need to believe my proclamation. And friends, we must believe Jesus' gospel. We must believe Jesus' gospel. In John chapter 3, verse 16, we see this gospel. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, as we work through this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, it might seem to you like verse 16 is reading as a summary statement, and that's because it probably is reading as a summary statement. Um, in a lot of your Bibles, that verse is going to be in red because the words that Jesus said are in red. But what we need to understand is that some editor made those words red after it was written. It wasn't like John had a black pen and a red pen when he wrote down the gospel. And so most scholars would argue that in either verse 15 or verse 16, the apostle John, who wrote the gospel, is explaining the interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus. And so that's why this reads as a summary statement. Now, as we look at this verse 16, one commentator points out to us this. The new birth is grounded into the lifting up of the sun. And so the lifting up of the sun is grounded in the love of God. In essence, what he's saying is to, the new birth, to be born again, is, is rooted in the fact that Jesus is going to die on the cross. That's how it's possible for someone to be born again. And the fact that Jesus comes and dies on the cross is rooted and grounded in the love of God. And so let's look at this love of God. Verse 16, for God so loved the world. When it says world there, it's referring to the people in the world, not necessarily the earth, the planet itself, but it's speaking of the people that are in the world. The emphasis in this verse is on God's love. For God so loved. For God loved the world in this way. That is where the emphasis of this verse lies. And so God shows us that he loves us in this way verse. In Romans 5, 8, it says, but God proves his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died. Some translations say prove, some translations say demonstrate, some translations say show, but the point of all of them is that God's love is a proven love. It's not something that we get to question. He has demonstrated, he has shown it, he has proved it. It's shown through the coming of the Son. Somebody here probably needs to hear this today. You need to stop looking for love from imperfect people that can't give it to you when there is a perfect love provided for you through Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. We don't have to search for love when love is right there before us. God loves us and he proves this to us by sending Jesus. There's a Chris Christopherson song that I've been listening to all week because small Paul don't want to sleep and then we went down that bluegrass country music road and this is just where we ended up. And the song says, Why me, Lord? And he says, Why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve even one? of the pleasures I've known. In essence, he's saying, God, why is anything good coming to my life when I know that I don't deserve any of it? And this song has resonated with me all week long because I know that of all the good things in my life, I don't deserve any of it, much less mercy and forgiveness and eternal life. But the resounding answer of John 3.16 that comes to answer the question of why me, Lord, is because I love you. The emphasis of John 3.16 is the love of God towards us. John goes on to say, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, meaning he gave his only son that we think of in life begets life. All other children of God are adopted. Jesus is not an adopted son. Jesus is a begotten son. And so God gives this only son to be the provision for us so that we can be saved. We need to understand the full gospel context of this giving that's spoken of here because what this is saying to us is that God gave Jesus to be lifted on the cross. When it says God gave his only begotten son, John has full in mind here that God gave Jesus to be lifted on the cross. 
the whole point of Jesus coming is Jesus coming to die. As we look at the incarnation, that the Word became flesh, the Word became flesh to die. As we enter into Christmas season and we got our trees and we got our decorations and we're ready to celebrate sweet little baby Jesus, we need to understand that sweet little baby Jesus came to die for you and for me. Because God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. When John says you must believe in him, he's saying you need to believe the full gospel. That Jesus lived the perfect life you couldn't live. That he died the death you deserved. That he was buried and that he rose from the dead. Believe in him. Believe the truth about Jesus. And you will not perish. Now to perish here means to continue the separation you are that exists between you and God now, it will go into an eternal separation where God is in his kingdom, reigning and ruling, and you are in a place called hell, being judged by God forever. Anybody, this is next week's sermon, we'll talk about this again next week, but we need to say it today. Anybody in this room who goes to hell is not going to hell because God doesn't love you, it's because you rejected God. The provision is there for you all you have to do is receive it eternal life is available for you all those who believe shall not perish but shall have eternal life if you don't have eternal life it's not because of God it's because of you and your rejection of his goodness and his mercy and his love towards you for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. Now a word that needs to be said about eternal life here, because in our our American church, thank you, we got it messed up, is that eternal life starts when you die. We take this verse, we read it, and we say, all right, I need to believe this so that when I die, I can go to heaven. And the goal of our evangelism has been to get people to heaven, but that's not what the scriptures teach. What the scriptures teach is that you need to be born again, and when you're born again, you are made new and you're brought to the kingdom of God. Eternal life starts the moment you're born again. When you are born again, you are filled with the Spirit of God, and you are brought into the body of Christ, and you live the life of Christ for the rest of eternity. You're joined with Christ in the likeness of his death and in the likeness of his resurrection. That is what eternal life is. And so eternal life begins the moment you're born again. The first time I ever heard this, your pastor said it like a decade ago. We were having a revival at the first church I served. And we had the first day and it was great and everybody loved it. And then the next morning, uh, how old was Phoebe, 19? A 19 year old young man from our church had a car accident and died. And the weight of that set over the community, and to be honest, it still sets over the community today. And your pastor, handling things the way y'all know him to handle things, gets up before we even start saying anything and goes, let's address the elephant in the room. And what he said was, eternal life for Devin started the day he trusted Christ, not this morning. Because you're born again when you trust Jesus for your salvation. You're born again when you put your hope in him. You were joined into the likeness of his death and joined into his resurrection. Eternal life for you begins the moment you trust Jesus. This is the reality of your spiritual state. For those of you who trust Jesus, you are living eternally right now in this moment. So what do we do about all this? What does the scriptures call us to do about all this? First, we need to recognize that you are separated from God because of your sin. 
If you never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are separated from God because of your sin. It's not as if you are a child of God. Our culture says that everybody's a child of God. The scriptures do not teach that. Our culture says that if you're a good person or a nice person, you get to go to heaven. The scriptures do not teach that. What the scriptures teach and what Jesus says is that you must be born again. So understand that your sinfulness separates you from God. And unless you do something about that, you're going to remain separated from God for the rest of eternity. You're going to sit under the full wrath of God. But you don't have to because Jesus already did. Jesus already sat under the full wrath of God for you so that you could be set free and so that you could be forgiven. And this is because God loves you. In Romans 5, 8, God proves his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died. God loves you. And he sent Christ to redeem you so that you could be born again, made new, brought into his family. And it's up to you not to reject the love of God. The way to be born again, the way to join God's family, the way to receive eternal life, the way to, be, the way to become a child of God is to be born again. And the text tells us that all we have to do is believe in him. To believe the good news about what Jesus has done. That Jesus lived the perfect life for you. That Jesus died death in your place. That Jesus was buried and that Jesus resurrected. Friend, if you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, let me encourage you, put all your eggs into one basket. Put all your hope into one thing. Look to the cross and be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he did for us on the cross so that we might be forgiven, so that we might have a relationship with you, so that we might know you. I ask that you would draw us to yourself. Jesus told us that if he be lifted up, he would draw all men to himself. And we know for certain that he was lifted up. And so we ask that through the power of your spirit and through the lifting up of Jesus, you would draw people to him this morning. If there's anybody here today who's never put their faith and hope in Jesus, I ask that you would work in their heart right now to draw them to him, to help them turn from their ways and their sin to trust him and to follow you. We ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray.